Um, in 1803, the United States completed what is now known as the Louisiana Purchase. In exchange for $15 million, the United States acquired a territory from France that today makes up 15 states. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, the president at that time, commissioned Captain Meriwether Lewis and Second Lieutenant William Clark, better known as Lewis and Clark, along with a select group of U.S. Army members and civilian volunteers, 40 in total, on an expedition into an unknown, uncharted territory. Lewis and Clark had the task of exploring, sketching, and mapping practical routes across the western half of the continent. Everything was new to them. Every step taken was a step taken on land that they've never been on before. A place with things they've never seen. An experience they've never experienced. Now, common sense tells us if we're the people to head west after them, and we have access to their sketches, their maps, their directions, we're going to follow them very closely, right? Today, as you graduate, you find yourself in a similar position. For our junior high graduates, tomorrow is a day like you've never lived before. You've never woken up a junior high graduate. Next year, school is brand new for you. You've never been a freshman in high school. The same goes for our high school graduates. You've never woken up a high school graduate. Next year, when high school starts, you won't be here. Some of you will go off to college, which you've never been a freshman in college. Some of you will pursue a job or career elsewhere, which for some of you, you've never done that before. Some of you have no idea what you want to do, and that's okay. So literally for you, it's unknown. For our junior high graduates, kindergarten, elementary, and junior high were grades that were pretty much laid out for you. For our high school graduates, those grades plus high school were grades laid out for you, meaning all you really had to do was show up, pay attention, do your work, apply yourself, and you'll move on to the next grade provided you pass. I mean, there was no real deep thought or planning involved. You just went through school. But now you're out, high school graduates. Now it's, it's over. Everything is new. Every day lived will be like a day unlike any previous day from here on out. You will have to put in thought and planning, especially because this is now uncharted, unknown territory for you. The good news, however, is that someone has already gone before you. Someone made a plan for you, a path for you. Someone has already been to your future and laid things out. Psalm 139 verse 16 says, Your eyes, being God's eyes, saw my unformed substance. In your book, God's book, were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, the days that were formed for you, when as yet there was none of them. Before you were even born, we all saw some of your baby pictures. Before those even existed, God planned wrote out all your days before you even lived one. So, just as much as common sense tells us, if we were to follow Lewis and Clark's maps, their sketches, in, in through territory that's unknown, common sense tells us, not only us graduates, but everyone sitting here. Because the future, tomorrow, the next hour, is unknown for all of us. But not for God. So common sense says, look to the plan, the map, the directions that he laid out. How, though? How do we do that? Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. 
In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. This verse is a picture of a roadmap of your life already laid out. And the one who laid it out is saying, trust me in everything. Before you speak, before you move, before you make decisions, before you take the next step, when things get tough and you come into rough waters, Rough terrain, dark forests, immovable mountains that seem to be an obstacle. Acknowledge me. Seek me. Be mindful of me. Submit to me. Know me. Obey me. And I will make your paths straight. This is a step-by-step, day-by-day, minute-by-minute walk with God. God doesn't give us the entire map of our life, where we're going who we're going to marry, how many kids we'll have, our jobs, our homes, the day we're called home. He simply calls us to trust Him one step at a time. And in doing that, we can be certain we end up where He wants us to be. As we go on this journey into what is unknown to us, there are four things we want you to take as you go. Four things you need to do. Four directions, if you will. And the first is, we need to face our fears. As we move forward into what is unknown to us, we must face our fears. One of the greatest hindrances to furtherance, to success, to growth, to life, is fear. Everyone knows what it's like to be afraid. When fear immobilizes us and keeps us from doing that to which we've been called, we are dominated by a spirit of fear. This kind of fear paralyzes us and keeps us from what we should be doing and could be doing. The Bible is full of commands to not fear. It's been said that the command to not fear appears 365 times in the Bible, one for each and every day. The Apostle Paul wrote a letter to a young man named Timothy who was much like you graduates. Timothy was a young pastor, the church of Ephesus, and the Apostle Paul was his mentor. Paul encouraged Timothy in his first letter to not let others intimidate him because of his young age. Timothy was afraid of being inadequate as a young pastor. He lacked self-confidence. This was unknown uncharted territory for him. In Paul's second letter to Timothy, Paul reminds Timothy that any cowardice in his life did not come from God. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. God fears nothing. God fears nothing. God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who once we trust in Jesus as Savior, takes up residency in our life, fears nothing. He provides the faith, the confidence, the comfort that we need to overcome and eliminate our fears. With God in control, we can face our fears. Going into high school can bring about fear. Going to a new school can bring about fear. Living far from home can bring about fear. Going in for a job interview can bring about fear. Sharing your faith, standing up for what you know is right, speaking truth, loving people, when everyone around you is hating people, can bring about fear. But God has not given those in Christ a spirit of fear. So we must face our fears with the absolute truths and trust in God. We must not bring our fears to God, but bring God to our fears. We must not bring our fears to God, but bring God to our fears. We don't tell God what we're afraid of. We tell what we're afraid of about our God. That was, that was good stuff. That was good. You should amen, clap your hands, nod your head. Because that's true stuff. We don't tell God about what we're afraid of. We tell what we're afraid of about our God because God fears nothing. Our fears fear God. Our fears fear God. And God is in you if you are in God. In order to move forward into what's unknown for us, 
in order to grow, in order to experience God and become who God has called us to be, in order to be successful in life, we must face our fears. That's the first thing. The second thing you do is forget our failures. Forget our failures. There's a reason the rear view mirror in your car is the size it is. And the windshield is the size it is. And that's because, if you didn't know this, to move forward, you need to look forward. You need to see forward. The windshield is big and wide so you can see what is ahead of you. And you follow the directions of the path laid out before you. What happens when you take your eyes off the road ahead of you and begin to look what's behind you? Not only do you miss everything passing you, but you may veer off the path. If you look in the rear view long enough, you may even crash, hurt yourself, hurt others. It's not safe. It's not healthy. And you may never get to where you need or want to be if you move forward while looking backward. Sadly and unfortunately, many adults here know what that's like. Some of us here stay driving looking in the rear view, living in the past, living with regret and guilt and shame of things we done months ago, years ago, even decades ago. We let our past and our failures not only define us, but determine which route we go. This is why we must learn from our failures and then forget our failures. The Apostle Paul, while in prison, wrote this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things, or that I've already reached perfection. I'm not there yet. I'm not saying that I am. But I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I reach on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. Forget the past. Forget the failures. Because there will be failures. It's not a matter of if we fail, but when. The only ones who never fail are the ones who never do anything. So when we fail, at tests, at jobs, during trials, in relationships, with problems, we must learn from it and then put it behind us. We must allow our future to shape us, not our past. We must never allow any failure to make us quit trying. You know, Thomas Edison spent more than $100,000 to obtain 6,000 different fiber specimens, and only three of them proved satisfactory. Each failure, the 5,997 failures, according to Edison, brought him that much closer to the solution to his problem. Henry Ford said that failure is the opportunity to begin again more intelligently. Moving forward, we must learn from our failures and then forget our failures. We must have a spirit of confidence in God and face our fears. The third thing we must do is follow our faith. We mentioned this briefly in the very beginning, but we want to go a bit more in depth with a story I'm reminded of about two gas company servicemen. A senior training supervisor and a young trainee were out checking meters in a suburban neighborhood. They parked their truck at the end of the alley and worked their way to the other end. At the last house, a woman looking out of her kitchen window watched the two men as they did everything. They checked her gas meter and she was watching them. Finishing the meter check, the senior supervisor challenged his younger co-worker to a foot race down the alley back to the truck to prove that older guys can still be faster than younger guys. As they came running up to the truck, they realized the lady from the last house was huffing and puffing right behind them. They stopped immediately and asked her what was wrong. 
Gasping for breath, the old lady said, when I see two gas men running as hard as you two were, I figure I better run too. The writer of the book of Hebrew uses this race talk to prove our point. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Forget our failures, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before you. It's already laid out. So how do we do this? We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Just like runners need a reference point when running a physical race, we need a reference point when running our spiritual race. If you're in the middle of nowhere, and you have no idea where you are, the first thing you do when trying to find your direction to some unknown territory is figure out which direction is north. Once you know where true north is, you can navigate from there. For Christians, our reference point is Christ. He is the way. He is who we look to. He is who we follow. He is who we strive to walk like, love like, be like. When it comes to the true north of Christ and his teachings as a reference point, we must not budge. We must not waver. We must not compromise. We must follow our faith fully focused on Jesus through high school, in college, our careers, marriages, parenting, retirement, death. We must follow our faith wherever it leads. Our faith, which is rooted in the gospel, which says that God created everything. The argument for whether or not God exists isn't even an argument anymore. You can ask our graduates, you can ask our eighth graders, anyone who has had Bible class, they can, they can defend the existence of God, the reliability of the Bible, the existence of Jesus. Archaeological evidence, historical evidence, Scientific evidence, DNA, morals, it goes on and on and on. God created us to be in a relationship with Him. But through our own freedom of choice, we've all gone our own way. We've neglected Him. We disregarded Him. We want nothing to do with Him. And that brought about sin into the world. And sin separates us from God. And God doesn't want that for anyone. So what God did is He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to earth in the flesh. And Jesus lived the perfect life. He never sinned. He offered himself as a sacrifice, taking your punishment upon himself so you could be made right with God. All you would have to do is repent. Change your thinking that brings about a change in behavior. Come to the end of yourself and say, God, I don't like the way I'm living. I don't want to live this life no more. I don't like sin. I want to be in a relationship with you. And the beauty of the gospel is keeping it in the context of school. It's like God would be the principal. And Jesus took all your classes. And he got perfect attendance. And he got an A on every class. He's on the high honor roll. And he stands right here with your diploma and says, all you have to do is get up out of your seat, come and take it. I took the test for you. I went through school for you. I paid the price for you. All you have to do is leave the life that you're living and come and follow me. It's that simple. It's that simple. And for many of us here, our graduates, they've done that this year. But for you adults, for you friends and your family that have not, you may have thought of you coming here for a graduation ceremony, but I could tell you this, God knows you. And God loves you. And God does not want you to leave here without coming into a relationship with him. So if you're sitting here today and some of the stuff that I'm saying for the first time in your life seems to make a little bit of sense. And you're realizing God is real and I am separated from him and I want to be made right with him. Then don't leave here without speaking to me, without speaking to our principal, our administrator, without speaking to Pastor Randy. Don't leave here without speaking with God. As we go on this journey into what is unknown to us, 
We must face our fears, being confident in God. We must forget our failures, learning from our mistakes. We must follow our faith, keeping our eyes fixed on Christ. Now you may ask, why are there these our in each one of our directions, facing our fears, forget our past, follow our faith? Why in our when this ceremony is all about you. There's an hour in our points because we are family. We are families of faith. Families of faith is more than just a name of a church and a school. It's what we're committed to building. It's who we are. In Christ, we are all family. The reason each point has an hour and not a your, is because we continue in the furthering of your future together. We as teachers, administrators, counselors, coaches, parents, friends, pastors will always be here for you. Graduates, look at me, each and every one of you. We will always be here for you. Whether you come back next year or not, whether you attend our church or not, whether you love this school or hate this school, whether you get married, get divorced, have a loved one, lose a loved one, when you get hired, if you get fired, when you're on the top, if you're at the bottom, we will always be here for you. Graduation isn't a goodbye. It's a let's go. Let's go together. Let's face our fears together. Let's forget our failures together. Let's follow our faith together. Because together, we are families of faith.